Okay, welcome back. We're on page 398 talking about the pros and cons. And one of the big cons is because SSL does endpoint to endpoint encryption, something in the middle to, to include a network intrusion system can't see inside the packet. So that's kind of a big deal. Okay. Um, there's no real n way to know from just from an intrusion detection system like this whether or not a, a, an attack was successful necessarily. That's kind of a, a thing. And then it could be fooled by what's called network fragments. Network fragments is when your system gets overwhelmed and your machine starts spewing not complete TCP IP fragments. Let's say a TCP IP packet got sent, but it got clobbered by another one who was sending at the same time. You know, they collided. And so it's a half of a packet or, or maybe it's even a packet that's too long or too big. And so this guy would pick that up and go, Hey, what's going on here? But in reality, it was just noise on the nine. And, you know, collisions on a network used to be a really, really big thing back in the hub days. But now in the switch days, there's less likelihood of having those type of collisions. So I kind of discount some of their concern about that. Okay. So uh, the next one they're going to talk about is wireless setup. So a wireless system. Now, unfortunately here, you know, I can put in one guy, right? And I can be good to go. But unfortunately for a wireless, I kind of need to be wherever there's a wireless access point. You guys have any idea how many wireless access points we have at the university? I don't. I just, I'm making the number up. I'm thinking, I don't know, 100. Well, if I wanted to adequately cover uh, the network... I'm probably going to need a hundred uh, intrusion detection systems. Basically, one, almost one for every location, which is woo. Okay, so there's some issues on page 398. We need to talk about specifically with the wireless version of this. All right, one of them is most likely these intrusion detection systems for wireless are going to be in non-secured areas. They're going to be in the lobby. They're going to be in the cafeteria. Right? Because that's where the wireless is. I mean, this guy, that physical device, that physical device here for our network-based thing, he's in a server room under lock and key. But anybody with a stepladder could go up and, and tinker with the, the wireless version of it, right? Because they're everywhere. Okay. So they're most likely not in a secure area. And they have somewhat limited range. Basically, it's the same range as the access point. Um... <clears throat> And then, you know, the switch locations may not be what the attack surface is. The attack surface is a term we use describing like, you know, all the, well, it's, I'm attacking something and so I, I want to reduce the attack surface by, you know, turning off ports that are not needed, that kind of stuff. That means I'm reducing the amount of opportunities there. Are. So in the, in the wireless world, I basically don't have an opportunity to do that. I, I, I just... I gotta have the I gotta have the the network devices everywhere, and even you know this is of course you've probably heard this like from tech support stories, but it's wireless. Well, yes, all wireless devices require a hardwired connection. Okay, so yes, I'm installing a wireless intrusion detection system of WIDS, but it needs to be jacked in with both power and hardwired line. Okay, I mean, yes, they're wireless, but they still have to report back through a wired connection. And then, of course, the cost of these things could get pretty high because you got so dang many of them. I mean, here, if it costs $5,000 for that, you know, this guy here for the, for the, uh, the network based one, okay, five grand, what the heck. But if I had to spend $500 and I had, a, you know, a, you know, a hundred of these things scattered around, I go, wait a minute, wait, that's getting kind of expensive, right? Okay. So the next thing I talk about is events. Uh, bullet list on page 399. So one of the things you're looking for is an unauthorized device. Okay. <clears throat> um, so one thing you could say is uh, this wireless service that we provide to whatever, our students, um, you have to have you know, an EduRoam account to be able to get in, but you can temporarily connect to the wireless system without, you know, it's like egg, the chicken 
before the egg concept, I have to be able to connect before I provide my account, because otherwise, how can I provide my account? In other words, it has to be able to connect just enough to be able to, I give my name and my password, and then it says, oh, okay, you're good, now you can go on, right? So there is some connection going on there, and you could be looking for, you know, maybe some hardware-based token or something that's special about your machines and your company, so you could say, you know, only company-made machines can connect to the network, that kind of thing. Okay, so unauthorized devices, That's there's lots of ways you can do that. I'm not going to get into too much details on the techniques. Or one's called a poorly secured device. Okay, um, one of the things that Microsoft has been working with for quite some time is if I connect, have an old machine that has been out of the loop for like forever, it's been turned off for like a year, okay? Which means you're pretty doggone well certain that it has not received updates, it has not had its virus signatures updated. I mean, this thing's been sitting in the closet for a year and you fire it up for the first time. What they want to do is detect that this is a poorly configured device. It's missing some updates. They want to quarantine it over here. So the only device, that the, the, the only server that this new device that has magically appeared, the only server it can see is what they call the remediation server. The one that has all the updates that are required, the virus signatures that are required, the security certificates, or whatever it is. You know, a single server out here, that's the only guy you can talk to and get you, until you get yourself together. And then after you get yourself together, well, then you can be exposed to the rest of the network. So one of the things that the wireless has to should be able to do is that. Should be able to detect whether or not you're secured. You're hunting for unusual patterns, right? Things that are kind of out of whack. I mean, for example, if I'm receiving uh, uh, I'm let's say I'm uh, it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm receiving a connection from out in the parking lot. You know I could use triangulation with several. You know even though my wireless devices are inside the building, I can use triangulation and figure out, hey, is this guy inside the parking lot, inside the building, or not inside the building? Right? I could do that. A detection of scanners. So somebody's out there trying to you know probe the system. And so they're, you know, running around going, boop, boop, you know, hitting all the access points and, you know, checking all the frequencies and doing frequency hopping, trying to find the best pattern, that kind of stuff. Yes, these guys can detect those. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, denial of, of service kind of a thing. And then if you try to impersonate a machine or a device, uh, it, can, it can help you out. For example, if I manually configured, let's say I have a laptop and I manually configured the IP address to match the IP address of the university and then I connect it to it through the wireless, okay? The wireless is gonna say, no, no, no. You know, I'm sorry, that, that clearly is not a hardwired machine. We don't allow hardwired and wireless at the same time, so that can't happen, and so therefore, I'm gonna say, you're impersonating someone. Okay, <clears throat> so the next one on page 399, talk about network behavior analysis, NBA, really? The NBA? Okay, cool. And so network behavior analysis, we kind of sort of mentioned that instead of just looking at like fingerprints for things that go wrong, we need to be able to detect anomalous behavior, which is what this guy does. So typically, this is like in the passive mode when you set these guys up. It'll look at, you know, the source IP, the destination, what layer you're using in the ISO map, you know, what port number, the number of time, you know, the the number of packets and the timestamps. It's just kind of recording all this stuff. It's in, and then after a while, it can detect a problem. And some of these times, you basically go in and they uh, they have like a learning mode. In other words, not everything is is dangerous. So you just install this thing, uh, and just let it run for a while, and it goes, okay, now I know what's normal, and therefore I'll be able to detect what's abnormal, right? Because right out of the box, it might not be able to do that. And so it can find some things. So let's say, for example, it can detect a d denial of service. Cool. It can detect a scanner or policy violations. Let's say you told people you shouldn't be able, you don't watch, you know, streaming videos during the day. Okay. That's, you know, some policy that you came up and said, no streaming videos during the day. Um, well, then that would be one of the things this guy could do. He could say, hey, I see a bunch of uh, streaming videos going on here. And, 
you might have some rules, like, I don't know, you know, some YouTube channel that has, you know, learning that's required. You know, you've made a, you made a, 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 a video or you've, you've told that you're, all of your employees, you need to go to this training on YouTube to be able to, to do something. Well, you know, so you can make exceptions. But viewing video and streaming music and things, these are all policy-based. And so a network behavior analysis would be able to tell you whether or not you are succeeding in, in doing. Remember, do care and due diligence. Don't watch videos during, you know, during business hours. And then you turn this guy on to prove that the policy that you've been in place is actually being followed. Yes. Okay. And so there's three basic types. The passive one, which is look but don't touch, you know. Just tell me what's going on. For example, the streaming guy. I probably, if I was, if it were me, I would probably say, don't do this, and then, then turn on NBA and then catch them at it, right? But I wouldn't have the machine, you know, turn off their video because maybe it was something legitimate. Like they, I don't know, they're in the middle of configuring a piece of software and they had to go to the YouTube to be able to find a video on how to do that, right? It, it's case by case basis. The inline which kind of sort of acts like a firewall where I could have it turn off, right? I can say, no, 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 I see you. I see you cheating. I see you on YouTube. And it just throws the switch and says, you ain't going to be able to get there no more. And then, of course, a more common one would have both. I mean, the capability of having, you know, passive plus run some sort of a script, you know, that says, hey, I need to turn this off or I want you to change that. Or, or maybe, you know, maybe all you want to do <clears throat> is if they're streaming videos, Maybe all I want to do is just throttle them, okay? Because the whole idea is not to punish people for watching videos. That's not, you know, that's nobody's goal. The goal is to <clears throat> reduce the amount of bandwidth being consumed by the outgoing wire that hooks up to the internet so your customers can get responsive, right? So maybe what you want to do is, sure, you can watch videos, but they're going to be throttled. That would be a good, a good kind of compromise, right? Okay. So continuing on page 400, and they talk about the host-based ones. Okay, now I remember the example I gave you with the host-based ones was like if you were a web server and you had end-to-end -end encryption, right? That's the only way I can look inside the packet to see what's going on is if it's on the host. Okay, cool. Um, so some people call this the system integrity verifiers. I never called it that. But basically, host based, what makes it, it different is it, it can see the encrypted traffic because the traffic got unencrypted when it got to the web server. Okay, so one of the things you can do here is maybe I have a folder, I don't know, I'll say I have a, a file server, and I have a folder where I keep some sensitive data, you know, uh, you know, personnel data and things like that. I don't know what it is. And so, Maybe you just want to make sure that no one's like copying those files, you know, or if they are, uh, what the heck are they doing? You know, at least record it all that, hey, somebody copied the entire contents of the, the payroll folder and it could be a completely legitimate reason or it could be something else, right? Okay, so this host-based stuff can do that kind of stuff because how would a network-based guy know what was important and what wasn't, right? In a file server, they couldn't know. But the host guy, could, yeah, this folder over here is important. This one's very important and this one's not very important, right? It can know. All right. So it can track other things. For example, it can track, you made a change to the registry file. That'd be a good one. Or security policies or configuration files, all these things that you know typically would not be done um, by a normal user, like it would try, it would, it would require administrator rights to be able to do. You can detect all that stuff, and because it's host based, it can happen whether it came through the wire or if it was a human sitting there doing it on the keys. Okay, so that's you can't do that with the with the network guy. All right, this is a good place to start for the fifteen minute mark. You know how this works. <laughs>